Hey everyone, Greg here with Science Studio, and yes, I finally have it. I have the i5 versus i3 matchup that you have all been asking me about. I have the benchmarks ready to go. They are in this video, and yeah. So let's get through the test bench real quick, and then we'll dive right into those results because I know you really want to know which one's better. I mean, come on, we know which one's better, but how much better is the i5 over the i3? So the cool thing about comparing two Intel 6th generation Skylake processors is that you get to use the exact same test bench for both. It was literally as easy as you know, pulling the processor out of one and replacing it with the other. So it's not gonna be any of this, well, you're using DDR3 over here and DDR4 over here, you know, and different, different motherboards, you know, different frequencies. I got a lot of that in the i3-6100 versus FX-6300. If you haven't seen that video already, go ahead and click the link here. But uh, basically people were complaining that I didn't have similar parts to compare with. They thought it was unfair, you know, come on. I can't get it, I can't get it perfect. I don't have the resources to get it perfect. And I honestly don't even think it is possible to get it perfect because they are such different platforms, one so much older than the other. So in this case, there won't be any of that. Everything that we've used in the test bench is exactly the same, save the CPU. So we actually used that thing right there for the test bench, uh, only we took out that GTX 960 in there and replaced it with the Sapphire Radeon R9 384 gigabyte graphics card that was used in the i3-6100 versus FX-6300 video. Just, you know, for consistency's sake, we wanted to see if the i3 would perform similarly to the time that it did in the other video, and it did. The i3 was very consistent in its results. So, the other parts that we've used are, one, the ASRock Z170 Pro 4 LGA 1151 ATX motherboard. We have eight gigabytes of PNY Anarchy DDR4. We have a Kingston 120 gigabyte solid state drive. So this is just for our boot drive so that everything will be nice and snappy. We have a Western Digital 320 gigabyte hard disk drive just for general storage. This is where all the games are located. And then we also have an EVGA 430 watt 80 plus power supply powering everything. So that's a test bench. You probably don't care much about that, but just know that everything's going to be super consistent. Okay, so let's get into the tests that we ran. Well, if you saw the last video, they're exactly the same. So you can go ahead and skip this part if you want. Go ahead and click here. Go ahead and skip ahead to the actual benchmarks. But if you haven't seen our last video, I will run through each of these tests with you. The first of the three CPU intensive tests is Cinebench R15. The various threads of a CPU are going to be used to render an image. And it will basically just stress the ability for that CPU to run those multiple tasks simultaneously. So that will be an interesting test for sure between the i3 and the i5 who both share the same number of threads. We have Geekbench 3, which is gonna be next. Geekbench 3 uh, is just, just gonna be the 32 gigabyte free software that anyone can pick up for free. So uh, there's a link to that in the description if you wanna just click on that and download it and see for yourself what your CPU power and performance is like. Uh, we will test single core and multi-core performance of both CPUs. And then the third and final, I guess, CPU intensive test is going to be Adobe Premiere Pro. So what we've done is we've taken a one minute video file and then we're going to be rendering it through both platforms, through both the i3 and the i5 platform, and lowest score will win. So whichever processor can render that one minute video file using the same preset, the fastest will win that benchmark test thing. And then the three games we've chosen are Dying Light, Grand Theft Auto V, and Dota 2. Nothing fancy, but we did kind of want to spread the spectrum out a bit, so Dying Light's a bit different than GTA, at least in terms of how you know, power is allocated and what's being used when. And then Dota 2 is just for those people that don't play either Dying Light or GTA and just want to see how World of Warcraft or Dota 2 will perform on a computer like this. So, the results for the first three tests. First up is Cinebench R15 and wow. So, the i3 scored 431, which I believe was only about four points off from the first time that we scored it of 435. So very impressive. So the i3 is very consistent there. But the i5, being that it does have two more physical cores, scored 673. So a pretty substantial increase in performance there. I would say that's probably about a 60% increase all around. That's pretty good. So even though both the i3 and the i5 share the same number of threads, Cinebench R15 likes its actual physical cores. On to Geekbench 32-bit. So, single core performance for both of these CPUs was identical, uh, practically. The i3 scored a 40-51, and the i5 scored a 40-33. So the i3 did edge out a bit of a victory, but they're, they're practically the same for all intents and purposes. Now, this should make sense, though, because they're both based on the exact same 14 nanometer Skylake architecture. So if you're just going to be stressing one core in both CPUs, and those cores happen to be identical in both, you should get 
pretty close to the exact same score. And Geekbench 3 definitely proved that. Now, in the multi-core side of things, the i5 definitely edged out a lead, scoring 1353 versus 8801. The 8801 was actually very consistent to its previous score for the i3, so that's good to, good to know. I guess it's not really surprising that they're getting exactly the same scores, but uh, that's definitely, I guess, reassuring. But the i5 definitely took the cake in this case. Now, I don't want to take away from the i3's performance. The i3 does wonders with hyper-threading. So if you're considering an i3 or the new Pentium Skylake processor, I would go i3. Four threads is definitely, definitely better than two threads. So off from Geekbench 3 and on to the Adobe Premiere Pro test. This one of the three CPU intensive tests definitely surprised me the most. The Core i5 rendered the video file in practically half the time. Uh, it took the Core i3 about a minute and 26 seconds. This video was a different video, a different one minute file from the previous video. I, I actually did it on purpose because I wanted to see if the actual content of the video affected the render speed. Uh, and it did to an extent. I mean, it only tacked on, I think, four or five seconds for the i3 score. But, I mean, regardless, the i5 just absolutely demolished the i3. I believe that Adobe Premiere Pro should have seen that both processors have four threads and probably couldn't tell the difference between the i3 and the i5 in terms of which was which. So it may have just assumed that both were i5s. But the i5, whew, 47.7 seconds? That's less than one minute per minute of video clip to render. So a 10 minute video file is gonna take you eh, about five minutes. Whereas for the i3, for a 10 minute video file, it's gonna take you about 15 minutes. So I thought the i3's performance was great, but wow, there is a huge difference between the i3 and the i5 for this test. That's very surprising. So if you're a video editor, definitely consider the i5 over the i3. Now, on to the stuff that I know you guys actually care about, the video games. First up on that list is Dying Light. Now, Dying Light, I presumed in the last video was mainly a GPU intensive game, so I didn't really think that CPU performance had much of an impact on how many frames per second that you received in that game. But from this test here, I think I was mistaken because uh, the i5 definitely made a difference. You can see that on our average FPS rate at least, uh, 63 versus 50 is, that, that's 13 FPS, that's quite a difference. And the max FPS got all the way up to 98 on the i5, whereas it only touched about 64 on the i3. So I think what happened in the last video, if you saw that one with the FX 6300, I think that the six cores of the FX 6300 really made a difference for dying light. That uh, is a bit of a game changer for me. I did not expect that from Dying Light, but the i5 definitely won, so, you know, it's really no surprise there. Now on to GTA 5. Of the three games that we tested, GTA 5 shocked me the most. GTA 5 is a very CPU intensive game. As you know, I've said that over and over and over again. The CPU that you have in your system will make a phenomenal difference on the frame rates that you'll see in GTA 5. But, wow, I did not expect this big of a difference literally double the average FPS rate. That was insane. I don't, I, I, honestly, I don't really know how to explain it. Um, I, they both have four threads. That's really all I can say. They both have four threads, and I know that the i5 is supposed to win because it actually has four physical cores, but I did not expect it to make that big of a difference. And I'm pretty sure GTA 5 sees the i3 as a four-threaded processor. I don't think it just sees two cores and two threads. I, I'm pretty sure it takes advantage of all four. So, I really don't know what to make of this. Um, both CPUs are clocked at the exact same frequency too. I, honestly, this is kind of confusing to me. Um, this one definitely shocked me. The i3 was consistent from the last set of results that we got from our previous video. So it's nothing on the i3 side. Uh, and VSync was off, of course. Um, I really don't know what else could have caused this much of a difference. Uh, the presets were all the same, but wow. So I guess what you can take away from this is, well, if you like to play GTA 5 a lot, you better get a really good processor if you want to see like phenomenal, superb frame rates. Um, that's really all I can say about that. Don't go with an i3 if you like GTA 5, unless you're okay with 60 FPS, in which case it really doesn't matter. So on from that, I'm still, I'm still surprised. I, that's such a big difference in GTA. Uh, for Dota 2, 1080p, max everything out, turn everything on, um, 
I realized that there's a FPS cap on Dota 2. I didn't feel like doing the, the weird editing and stuff to, to you know, eliminate that cap. But basically, you can only get 120 FPS from Dota 2. It's just limited that way. So I guess this test is probably the most flawed um, because we really couldn't see how much better the i5 did over the i3. Um, and I honestly didn't even realize that in the last video. So the last video's results are probably skewed as well. I will make it of that in that video. You can see that the i5 practically maxed out at 120 the entire time, whereas the i3, yeah, we can say that the 119 is probably 120. I think that the cap had something to do with that as well. The i3 was pretty much, it was borderline, it was close. Now the minimums definitely dropped significantly more uh, for the i3, you know, when things got intense and everyone was throwing weird spells at each other. I would say that if you're just a Dota 2 World of Warcraft player, you know, something like that, for going the i5 and getting the i3 or even getting something like an FX 6300, not really going to be a problem there. So it really just depends on preference, it depends on what kind of games you like to play and what kind of frame rates you would like to play those games at. So. That's really it. That's really all I've got. Uh, the most surprising results were, of course, Grand Theft Auto V and the Adobe Premiere Pro rendering times for the i5 compared to the i3. Now, the i3 is a phenomenal processor. It, it really is a great budget processor. Um, and I think that if I had to do it all over again, you know, if I was really on a budget, I would still probably go with the i3. Just because most of the games that I like to play were playable at 60 or 70 FPS with the i3. But if you're a hardcore gamer or you render a lot of videos or you really want to see those extra frames per second on that 144 hertz crazy gaming monitor that you have, going with a processor that has more physical cores definitely makes a difference in every part of your PC life, but in particular, intensive games and video editing and rendering. Most people are going to want to do more than just watch videos on their computers. So at least an i3, at least an i3, at least an FX 6300 if you want to go AMD, something like that, an Athlon, quad-core Athlon 2 processor, something like that. Don't forego the additional threads. It, it makes a huge difference. And if you're very picky and very particular and like to do a lot of heavy editing and hardcore stuff on your computer, then definitely, definitely more cores is better. At least that's what I've taken away from the benchmarks that we received from this video. So that's about it everyone. If you liked the video, give us a thumbs up. Let us know that you really like this video. I know you've been waiting on it a long time, so I'm glad we can finally bring this to you guys. If you hated the video for whatever reason, give us a thumbs down. We do look at those. We do pay attention to those. Let us know in the comments below what you'd like to see next and what you would like to see us improve upon in future videos. Be sure to subscribe. Check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Stay tuned for more videos, more science-y videos, more computer-related techie videos. I'm going to end the video now. This is Science Studio, everyone. Thanks for learning with us.